To all the drivers out there delivering holiday cheer across our great country, season's greetings and a huge thank you from the Allen Lund Company. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Scott Thompson. Welcome to the show. We'll start things off here in a bit with a reality check of sorts, courtesy of our friends at the American Transportation Research Institute. They're out with new analysis of California's plans to cut down emissions. The state will be relying heavily on electric vehicles to get that job done. But actually crunched the numbers and found a boatload of challenges. And then we'll touch base with a former heavy hauler who has turned his passion for videography and trucks into a full-time gig. We speak with Chris Fiffy about his career, his iconic rolling CB interviews, and all the miles in between. But first, we're going to check in with Jamie Jones and Mark Schrimmer of Landline Magazine for a talk about broker fraud. Lawmakers are now calling for action. And before we check in with Jamie and Mark, listen to this exchange between Representative Mike Bost of Illinois and FMCSA Administrator Robin Hutchison at a hearing within the House TNI committee earlier this month. I've heard a lot of motor carriers right now uh, that that freight fraud is involved real, really bad with scammers. Uh, and let me tell you how this works. We have people who are out there that are claiming to be brokers. Uh, the truck drivers are out there trying to find loads or their companies are trying to find loads for them. They, they use this broker. The broker all of a sudden comes in and gets in the middle of the, of the supply chain issue and they broker the load. Now, by the time that driver then gets back in or that company gets that load back in and ready to be paid for, they contact that particular company and they are no longer in existence or you can no longer find them. Is there anything that your agency is doing and can be dealing with as far as the fraud that is occurring out there? Because we're losing a tremendous amount of smaller companies and or, uh, uh, and or owner operators because it's one thing if a great big company takes a $2,000 loss or $5,000 loss, but the smaller companies can't take that. Representative, I appreciate your experience in the industry. We unequivocally share your concerns about the impact of fraud on the industry and specifically broker fraud. Um, We are taking steps. First and foremost, we issued a financial responsibility rule that will uh, ensure security limits for brokers and freight forwarders is increased to $75,000. We know that's not enough. We are also taking steps to improve transparency in transactions. We've been listening to our stakeholders working very closely with OIDA, uh, TA, and others. Thank you for Th- Thank you. My time is So, Jamie and Mark, we finally reached a stage where Congress, it seems, is fed up with this broker fraud problem as well as you heard there in the voice of Representative Bost, um, which I take as a positive in a way mm-hmm. because now we're getting more pressure on FMCSA to do something about this. And hopefully we will see something about it. Yeah. And and first, let's uh, maybe give a little credit to, to Representative Bost, uh, who, as we know, uh, has a, a background in trucking. Uh, his family has run a trucking business uh, for years. Uh, he's been a champion uh, on the Truck Parking uh, Safety Improvement Act. Um, so uh, he was able to to relate and really kind of, I think, in that, in that uh, quote that we heard, kind of break it down of what's happening to these trucking companies and also... Uh, explaining uh, to the administrator how this is negatively affecting uh, small trucking companies. And as the administrator has said many times, that they're trying to do everything they can um, to uh, stop um, you know, truckers uh, from from leaving the industry because they have the, all the data that says the truckers that stay in the industry the longest are the safest ones out on the highway. This is another example. They get caught up in this in this broker fraud, which we're seeing uh, estimates of eight hundred million dollars annually uh, that, that that's coming from this. And so, uh, like I said, a ton of credit to Representative Boss for for bringing this up as as part of the hearing and really you know making sure that the at FMCSA is planning to do something about this issue that's been going on for decades. Yeah, I just it, it always amazes me when they sit there and she even acknowledges the 75,000 uh, rep, uh, administrator Hutchins. Yeah. Anyway, she acknowledges that 75,000 isn't even enough still in this day and age. And I remember it wasn't too terribly long ago we were looking at 10,000 on a broker bond. Yeah. And the problem is you can have any amount under the sun, really. You know, you could have 100,000, 200,000, whatever. 
But once that bond is gone, it's gone, and anybody else who's trying to make a claim against it is left out in, out in the cold. And so I think that's what's so important about what OIDA is doing, that, you know, we're acknowledging these baby steps. At least we're to 75,000, but I think it's important to note that OIDA is relentless on this issue, that these are merely steps they are taking, but it's not the solution to the entire problem yet. And it's going to take a lot of solutions because it is such a big problem. Uh, We do have a final rule on financial responsibility, right, taking effect in January, which is a step in the right direction. Um, We spoke earlier in the week about OIDA's petition, essentially asking for more, uh, which makes sense because, again, more needs to be done here. But we are heading in the right direction. We are seeing some progress. And FMCSA, as we have talked about before, does acknowledge this issue, mm-hmm. does realize it's a problem. The question being, you know, what is it going to look like when they do end up tackling this and how long is it going to take? And that's kind of OIDA's stance in all of this, right? Well, and Jamie, you probably know, uh, you know, more on this th- th- than I do from the background, but I know, like, even this, that the, this financial responsibility, this goes all the way back to MAP 21, right, which is mm-hmm. two highway bills ago. That's a long time ago to, you know, for to even move forward on this. And then you look back on um, OIDA, you know, petitioned FMCSA all the way back in, I think, May of 2020 about the broker transparency issue. Uh, you know, the good news was this past March, um, you know, they granted that petition and said, we're going to we're going to make a rulemaking. But then uh, here in recent months now, we're seeing that that notice of proposed rulemaking won't actually uh, come out until I think Halloween of 2024 yeah. is, is the. Yeah. Will it be a trick or a treat, too? So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, will, the, and will it even come out at that point? Yeah. 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 We, we don't know. So, I mean, it, it's one of those things. It's it's this issue. We're seeing all these problems. Um, you I'll, I'll give some credit uh, to Administrator Hutchison for saying some of the right things there, as, as uh, Jamie alluded to, uh, uh, mentioning that 75000 isn't enough and, and that more needs to be done. But this is something that, you know, this petition, like I said, really originally came out in, you know, mid-2020, um, you know, and now we are and we're talking about we might not even have anything moving on a, a real form of a proposal until almost 2025. That That's just not acceptable. I mean, with all of all of the issues that are going yeah. on. Yeah, it's really not because, I mean, you re- if you look at it and this – there's always problems in the broker side of the industry. I mean, just like any other career or profession out there, there's always bad apples. So – but we have definitely seen – an influx, you know, an increase in broker bo- uh, broker fraud oh, yeah. and, you know, double, triple brokering, um, all kinds of just, you know, illegal behavior. Shenanigans. Shenanigans. I yeah. love it. Yeah, let's not Lots even put a, let's not put a legal term on it. But that's what that's what makes this transparency so important, because that would give these small motor carriers the ability to see that food chain of money, if you will, and see if there is some double and triple brokering going on in there and that maybe this load isn't really worth what, you know, originally it would have been Mm -hmm. had so many people not grabbed something off for merely taking an electronic data file and moving it from one computer to another. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's literally all the work that these brokers do in a lot of cases. Our thanks to Jamie and Mark for putting all of that into context. A reminder, if you want to make sure your elected officials in Washington, D.C. understand the problems you and other truck drivers are facing out there, you can find a one-stop shop for doing that at FightingForTruckers.com. Coming up next, California is trying to cut down emissions, and they're going to be leaning heavily on electric vehicles. But Atri has some new analysis on the topic, and it raises some important questions. That's up next on Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com.
Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now, welcome back. About a year ago this month, we told you about a report from the American Transportation Research Institute about the challenges that face the trucking industry amid attempts to electrify it. Well, the Institute is out with a sequel of sorts to end the year, taking a look at the issue through the lens of California's attempts to go green. And joining us with the details is Atri's Vice President, Jeff Short. Jeff, thanks for speaking with us again. We appreciate it. No problem. Absolutely happy to discuss any of our research, especially on electrification, which is certainly an ongoing topic and one that probably isn't going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think this one is uh, is particularly interesting. Um, and I guess the question this analysis that you have here seeks to answer is whether California is basically ready for an electric vehicle future. We're going to get into that answer to that question here in just a moment, but we should mention that this appears, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, this appears to have gotten started last December with Atri's report called Charging Infrastructure Challenges for the U.S. Electric Vehicle Fleet. Can we go back to that for those who may not remember, uh, refresh our memories about what that report found? Because this is, if I'm not mistaken, kind of a continuation of that. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So with that report, we looked at the full United States, um, and and we said, what would it take to change the fleet in the United States of cars, trucks, SUVs, pickup trucks, everything, to electric? And what are the major uh, impediments facing us to move in that direction? So the first one is the amount of electricity. And we went and calculated how much electricity would be needed to move vehicles in the same manner they're moved uh, today. And what we found was it would require an increase of 40% of the electricity produced. We, so today's electricity, vehicles would consume 40%. Um, we would need massive uh, utility, infrastructure, investment, more electricity to be produced in, in order to meet that goal. And then we also looked at how much uh, how much of the materials that go into the batteries would be required to replace the U.S. fleet. And that was a huge number. There was many, many uh, years, in some cases decades, of global production would be required. And also, a lot of the known reserves would have to go to U.S. vehicles. And, and granted, there will be a number of other countries who will be seeking these materials. And then finally, from a specifically trucking perspective, we said, what's this going to take as far as truck parking? How are trucks going to refuel? And we found that there's a huge need for chargers. There would need to be a charger at every single truck parking spot in America, at the very least, more than 300,000 fast chargers to support the trucking industry. And that would cost a lot, require a lot to maintain that as well. So those were the national questions. And the takeaway was we're not ready. And then you kind of are now focusing on California here, I imagine, because California has been uh, at the forefront of of pushing this electric vehicle future, right? Yes, California is definitely at the forefront. and, And folks are working to comply with California's rules if if you're a trucking company that meets uh, their requirements, I, I believe in January 2024, in a couple of days, really, you're going to have to be in a certain place in order to continue to operate in California. So we received a lot of interest in in the national report and also a lot of questions. How is California prepared for this? Are they ready to move 
uh, to an all-electric fleet. And the answer to that question appears to be no, based on based on the analysis that I've seen here. Is that a pretty safe uh, a safe assumption there? So we found a lot of challenges. I can't say that that it, it's impossible or that it's possible. We went through all of the research we did in the past and said these are some of the challenges uh, when it comes to moving, in particular, Class Eight trucks over to electricity in California. And um, quite frankly, is it possible? Certainly anything's possible. Is it practical? It doesn't seem to look practical when you look at some of these numbers. Yeah, and I want to make sure we get through all of these because I think it does, when you put them all together, paint a pretty clear picture of where we are at right now. Um, and as you kind of put it there, the challenges that we're all facing or California's facing as it, again, attempts to move into this new phase here. So let's kind of go through these here. And you, you, you kind of label these as realities. Um, again, realities <laughs> in, a, in another word could be challenges here. One reality that you mention here in this report, this analysis, is that the state of California is currently, right now, as we speak, consuming more electricity than it's producing. And if we were, were to, again, transition to electric vehicles, Class A trucks, that consumption is going to be a lot higher even than it is now, right? Can you talk a little bit about the that particular reality and particular challenge? Yes. So California is the large, uh, second largest consumer of electricity in the country, um, fourth largest producer of electricity. So they don't make as much as they consume, hence they're the first largest in net imports of electricity. This electricity they import is coming from, let's say, states like Nevada, Arizona. It's also coming from Mexico, in fact. So what we see as a challenge here is that California doesn't necessarily want to produce a lot of electricity in the in the ways that is currently available. Uh, as far as non-renewable sources, that makes up 60, 66.4% of the electricity is from non-renewable sources. That means natural gas, that means nuclear, but the plurality, if you will, of, of production is from natural gas. Only 33.6% is renewable. That would be solar and wind mainly. So even if cars and trucks are using the electricity, it's more likely than not to be coming from a non-renewable source, uh, which doesn't necessarily solve any of the problems that, are, that we're attempting to solve here. And the result of that, I mean, who's going to get a pain for that, right? You kind of determine here that consumers are going to end up paying more for goods that are delivered by electric truck uh, trucks, considering the current environment, right? Yeah, uh, the consumers will will ultimately pay that cost if it's in the form of electricity, or even if it's in the form we don't really touch on it. And the the cost of of these trucks is over four hundred thousand um, dollars, two to three times more expensive than a diesel truck that can do the same job. So. Certainly, total cost of ownership, that hasn't been settled whether or not it's, it's cheaper or not, but it looks more expensive from, from this research perspective. Of course, time, the old cliche is time will tell. Yeah. Will these prices change? Will these prices come down? I don't see how electricity in a place like California is ever going to be cheaper than it currently is. And as far as battery materials, uh, which is another thing we touch on. Battery materials, the price of these materials may uh, may go up significantly as more countries demand the materials for their electric cars. Yeah, it's a scarce resource for sure. Uh, one more thing, too, and we talked about intentions earlier. I want to make sure we talk about this as well, because the intention here, of course, is to uh, lower emissions and, uh, you know, go green, essentially, but you point out in this analysis, <laughs> once again, that California is going to need to run even more battery electric Class 8 trucks to haul the same amount of freight that's being hauled right now. Can you talk a bit about that? That's correct. We've looked into our operational cost of trucking report. Uh, we receive a lot of um, operational data points from 
hundreds of trucking companies over the years telling us how much it costs to run their operation. So we looked at how many in the truckload sector in particular were were hauling enough freight that they would need another truck. And this is because uh, a battery electric truck, some of them are, are to do the same job as as a diesel truck. They they may have to weigh more than thirty thousand pounds just for the just, just for the truck, just for the class eight unit. So our calculation came out to um, for every one thousand trucks, an additional three hundred forty three trucks would be needed would be required due to battery weight. And and that's based on real data. That's based on real operational data. If you are weighing weighing out your truck at eighty thousand pounds plus, you're going to need another truck because the battery weight is going to be eating up uh, the space for cargo. Yeah, and again, when you put that, you know, take that into account, and you put it together with all the other things we've talked about here, these realities, these challenges, it really does have you scratching your head, and you understand where they're trying to get. Um, because it's a it's a noble goal, and I think it's one that mm-hmm. everybody can agree is is worthwhile. But it does feel like things are being rushed here uh, in California and in other states as well. I guess as we try to kind of wrap this up in a nice tiny bow, um, what is the path forward? I guess this analysis. What do you hope comes from it, uh, or do you hope anything comes from it? I suppose. So. I think we need to step back and look at all of the options that are out there. Certainly, electrification is is one option. It does work in certain segments of the trucking industry. The industry is is all for decreasing CO two and other other emissions. But is this the right way? Uh, one of the realities we point out here is certain areas of California's electricity generation. You have the largest power plant in California is a nuclear power plant. It provides eight and a half percent of the state's electricity and folks want it closed. Folks in the state want this nuclear power plant closed. I'm not an expert on how safe or unsafe uh, this particular power plant is, but I do know there's pressure to close it. Uh, It is scheduled to close or was scheduled to close in 2025 and the state realizes that this is a source of electricity uh, that does not have CO2 emissions, let's say, uh, that is critical and, and its future is, is up in the air. Um, so that's, that's just one example of something California needs to look at before, before they push all, all of these rules towards the industry. They need to step back and say, can we actually deliver the electricity that's needed? And it's a lot of electricity. And and there are lots of questions whether or not uh, the sources of that electricity, uh, how stable they're going to be. Because the amount of megawatt hours required by the state is going to increase dramatically uh, as more people adopt electric vehicles. That's really a no-brainer. I mean, yeah. the more vehicles out there, the more electricity is going to going to be needed. And we can't rely on, let's say, battery technology to catch up because we just don't know. Are the batteries going to get denser? Are they going to be able to hold more? Are the vehicles going to be more efficient? We can make assumptions, but we don't actually know. But at the end of the day, it's very clear that electricity uh, production is going to have to increase dramatically, uh, especially when we're talking about class eight trucks, which are going to use a tremendous amount just because of the job they do, because they are moving tens of thousands of pounds of freight. Our thanks to Jeff Short of Atri. Check out his analysis for yourself at truckingresearch.org. And as a reminder, these aren't just hypotheticals. Starting this coming year, manufacturers in California are required to start increasing their production of zero emission trucks. And by 2035, the state aims to have 300,000 zero emission trucks on the road. For Landline Now, I'm Scott Thompson. Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. 
For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. Landline now, welcome back. Chris Fifey joins me now. He is a former heavy hauler turned commercial photographer, video producer, graphic designer, web developer, and founder of Big Rig Videos. Whether it's at a truck show, a rolling CB interview, or capturing video of an oversized load, Fifey has made a successful career for himself. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Starting off, can you talk to me about what Big Rig Videos is? Well, I guess the, in the in the short of it, Big Rig Videos is just a, a platform that showcases the uh, the custom semi trucks that run across America. Uh, so that's the the short of it. And and the the long of it, I'm curious about that and and how you got started. Okay, so going deeper into what Big Rig Videos is. It's just been a way for me to be creative with the the video production experience that I have over the years. I started in video production in 1998, but it's always been a hobby of mine since the age of 16. So in 2012, I had the, the opportunity to do a project for the Chrome Shop Mafia, which is also known as Four State Truck. And... I saw the opportunity to uh, be creative with my video production skills because, you know, prior to 2012, I would create uh, TV commercials, training films, you know, photography for, you know, local businesses and things like that. And so you can only be so creative, you know, so there's, there's a, there's a stopping point, you know, where you can't, you can't do something cool with a TV commercial when it's for a doctor or funeral home or something like that, you know, but when dealing with some of the, you know, the guys that we know or some of the owner operators that we know in the field now that have, you know, really awesome trucks that they uh, themed out, it's easy to be creative. And so I kind of gravitated toward that and I shifted my attention away from what I was doing locally to what I could do nationally. And saw that there's an opportunity to to put this you know video content out in a larger space. Did you have any background in trucking at all? Yeah, so this also goes back to probably 1995, 1996, where I wanted to uh, I wanted to ultimately have a video production business, but at that time it was pretty expensive to, to buy the right equipment. So I realized that the best way to be able to afford to buy this equipment was to, you know, get a class A license and, you know, drive a truck. And that afforded me the ability to, to eventually buy the equipment that I wanted. So the background in, in trucking really helped me do what I do now because uh, what I did was heavy haul and, you know, moving machines and things like that, but it allowed me to understand, you know, the mind of a trucker, you know, how the trucks maneuver, how they move, you know, what's necessary, the, you know, the mechanics of a, of a truck and things like that. So it allowed me to, you know, speak the language of the guys that are, that I film now. And talk to me about, I mean, you have a long list of the types of videos that you do. Um, kind of walk me through those. Okay. So it really, it really depends on the, the situation that I come into. And it started out where I would just go to truck shows and film what I saw. And, you know, Brian Martin from Four State Trucks and I, we had an idea that, hey, well, why not just create a DVD series? And uh, this DVD would showcase a show, a truck show, and kind of give someone the impression that they were there. They would. You know, be able to see what happened at the you know before the show started, during the show, and after the show. You know, on this DVD. So after several years, the DVDs became less popular, and so now everything's on the internet. So I still you know, had to kind of you know create this this content, but I had to kind of you know categorize it. And so that's where you know answering your question comes in. I realized that there there could be different different categories 
you know, for different styles of filming. And this is what I enjoyed because I got to be creative in different categories. So the, the simple uh, owner operator interview is something where I could get in depth with uh, a guy that's owned, you know, own a truck and has his own authority. And uh, he might be able to, to share some of the hurdles that he's gone through in order to get where he is and some of the troubles and some of the, some of the triumph and just some, and just really relate to the average guy who wants to take that step uh, and be an owner operator. Uh, whereas the, the rolling CB interviews are something that, again, it's, uh, I, I found them, you know, creative and fun to do because you, you get to take the, the truck that might be seen at a truck show sitting on the, the parking lot that looks beautiful, looks brand new, or looks uh, looks like it's never seen a, a day of work in its whole life. So being able to take the truck and the driver out on the highway and have a different visual, a different visual dynamic where the viewer gets to understand that, wait, this truck does work or he does put a load on it or this is what it sounds like or this is how it moves. And so th- that in itself, the rolling CB interviews have become the, the most popular category of videos. And um, it's what people seem to the interview the most. And the content within the rolling CB interview could range from you know, where a guy grew up uh, and how he got started in, in the trucking, in his trucking career to, you know, advice to, you know, who's at home, you know, waiting for him to come back or just, if anything in between. So it, it becomes a real nice conversation because now there's time to actually have a conversation while a guy is actually on the road traveling. So there's sometimes there's no time limit on some of these, these rolling CB interviews and, and there's everything else in between. Uh, the last thing I'd mentioned or the last two things I'd mentioned would be just uh, some feature documentaries that I've done that uh, will kind of isolate one particular you know character or person and really dig into to their life one of the more popular videos is one that i did with uh, a gentleman that has become america's trucker he's known as bob spooner and i got to do a, a two-hour sit-down interview with him where we went through every single aspect of his life and he recalled you know stories from the from the sixties and the seventies and eighties and very, very, very colorful interviews. Uh, so those, those feature documentaries are fun to do because it's, you know, it's usually done away from a truck show and it's a little more intimate <laughs> and everything else in between, you know, little clips and things uh, from these truck shows will find their way onto the uh, YouTube channel or the, or the Facebook page. The rolling CB interviews, I know Jamie Jones, that was, I think, the first thing she told me about you. Um, and, and she said those have really become like a badge of honor um, when, a, when a truck gets one of these interviews. How, talk to me about the logistics of how you do those. Yeah, it has been uh, said, and I, I feel really, I feel honored that a guy would say that it's his bucket list to be uh filmed for rolling CB interview. Uh, so the first time that um, I thought of this, you know, idea was uh, coming, I was coming to a show or a show was coming up and that was a Richard Crane Memorial show in uh, Michigan. And I wanted to be able to film this convoy that these guys were planning, you know, from point A and point B was the actual show site in St. Ignis. And so they had a, a two hour ride. And I thought, well, it would be great to film this convoy of, of trucks, you know, from the side of the road or from an overpass. And that's typical. And you can usually get some really good, you know, shots and things like that. But the, the downside is that I'd have to, you know, grab my equipment and hop in the car and try to drive ahead of them again. And do the same thing, and do the same thing, and just you know, kind of like a leapfrog. But I, I thought that that wasn't good enough, and so I just kept thinking about it. And I said, "Well, there has to be a way to just film these guys while they're driving." And I had no idea how to pull that off, other than being in someone's video. 
or I'm sorry, in someone's vehicle. But as I thought about it more, I'm like, okay, this is great. You know, two hours of just filming these guys. It'd be awesome to be able to talk to them while, because we got two hours to kill. So I'm like, well, how would I do that? Oh, well, naturally over CB radio. And so these problems, I kept solving these problems, but another potential problem would come up and I'd go, well, how do I solve that? So the next thing was, okay, I can talk to them over CB radio, but I want to be able to record what we're, this conversation, you know, this two-way conversation. And so this was, uh, I think, 2013. Uh, 20, yeah, 2013. And so the technology wasn't, we had technology, but it wasn't designed to use, be used the way that I wanted to use it. So I had to quickly do some research within like a day or two to figure out what I can put together in order to like crudely uh, attempt to, you know, re- record these guys and have a conversation while they're driving down the highway. So I came up with, um, what you'd see a, a, a crew chief or a, a pit crew chief, mm-hmm. their headsets with a microphone and things like that, and they're communicating to the rest of the pit crew. And so I realized that, okay, well, these are noise canceling because we need to be able to cancel out all of the wind because if I'm going to ride along, you know, in the back of someone's pickup truck, there's going to be a lot of wind. Um, I found a uh, inexpensive uh, mobile CB that had uh, the ability to, like, you know, have a base antenna attached to it. And so I had to rewire some of the wiring and, and make a fitting to connect to the plug into one of my cameras. And then the last low tech piece of this uh, equation was a beanbag chair from Walmart that I put in the back of the phone's pickup truck. Oh, wow. And that was the beginning of the Rolly CB interview. So when I hopped on a plane and got to the destination i put everything on uh this is a uh, way alone uh from diesel freak uh I put everything in the back of wade's truck and and we're getting ready to go and i queued up on the cb and i said all right guys how how do i sound they're like you sound pretty good so we got on the highway and now we're doing 65 miles an hour i said all right guys how, how am i sounding here you know uh is there any wind noise or any wind interference they're like nope crystal clear and so at that point, I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I might have something here. And we had a great conversation. And it was a lot of fun. And all of those guys were just like so pumped up and energized for the fact that they got to, I guess, have a, a different kind of conversation going down the road, but also be, you know, filmed or visualized in, in, a, in a way that hadn't been done before. And um, once I got back home from that show, I said, okay, well, that's not the safest way to do that because, you know, I did it in a pinch, but I'm not going to ride around people's pickup truck doing this. So I had to figure out a way to do it from, from a vehicle and do it safely and, and be able to repeat the process. And so I went back to the, to the drawing board and came up with some other ways of doing that that were successful and revised it again, you know, about a year later uh, with more technology. And um, so I always like revising things from now. But the culmination of everything is like the I'm the only person in the world that holds these kind of interviews at the speed that I do for the length of time that I do, you know, in the world. So no one else does that that way. And for me, it's just a lot of fun. That was Chris Fifey talking about his career capturing big rigs. If you want to check out his work, you can visit bigrigvideos.com. There you'll see his rolling CB interviews, super and oversized loads he's captured, interviews, truck shows, and much, much more. We're going to take a short break, but stay tuned to hear more from Chris Fifey. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com, because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Chris Fifey of Big Rig Videos. Chris, you've sat down with so many drivers over the course of your career. Can you talk to me about the kind of passion you notice these drivers have? 
Yes, they do. And, you know, if it's a first generation, you know, truck driver or a third generation truck driver, they have the same passion. They're a different breed. You know, they're, you know, almost like mentally they're, they're just different and they're just wired in a way that they want to, you know, take a challenge of doing what they do and moving whatever type of it, whatever type of freight it is. So they take it very seriously and the pride that comes within that just starts kind of bubbling out even. So if it's a guy that has an old beat up, uh, you know, you know, freight liner that doesn't look like the typical long nose Peterbilt or Kenworth, he has just as much pride because at the end of it, he gets to, you know, feed his family or, you know, help take care of family, you know, immediate family or what have you. There's something that there's a reward that comes from that that creates that pride. And, you know, and the other thing that, that I take away from the fact that these guys have to, you know, spend the amount of time that they spend on the road to, to make a paycheck or to, you know, to pay a bill that takes away from those same people that they're providing for. And so they're still prideful, but I'm just as thankful for them taking that time to be away, you know, a week at a time, two weeks or a month at a time. So, um, uh, being able to sit and kind of showcase what they do or showcase who they are as a person. It's kind of like my payback, you know, to them and, and also their, their ability to know that what they do is, is being seen by the rest of the people in the industry and even people outside of the industry. And I noticed on your website, you also do um, super or oversized loads. Um, talk to me a bit about that and the process um, and kind of, I mean, there's a lot of planning that goes into moving those loads just on its own, but what is your planning process like? Okay. So that's kind of a, a fun question. Yes, there's some of these loads they've been planned for years and I'll get a call, you know, a couple of days prior, maybe four or five days prior. You know, that's like actually a lot of time, but sometimes it could be just a couple of days wow. where some of the companies say, Hey, oh, by the way, did anybody call, you know, you know, a camera guy or are we going to get this photograph or are we going to get it filmed? And so they were like, okay, well, we'll, we'll call Chris. And so sometimes they will hop on a plane and whatever I arrive, I have to figure out, you know, where they're going, travel speed, uh, what the route is, you know, how to, you know, visualize this process, you know, where to place the cameras. And a lot of times these guys, they're, they're traveling for, for days or some of the segments that I travel with them are two to three days, uh, you know, eight, nine, you know, 10 hour days. And so I have to build in a process that allows, you know, filming for that length of time, you know, instead of filming, you know, you know, 15 minutes at a time or whatever it is, or, you know, so it's, it's the process is, a whole lot longer and different than, than the typical. But the, the takeaway is the, the audience, well, not just the audience, because the, these companies don't do this for an audience, but the takeaway is that these companies, they get to showcase what they do and how they do it and with some of these impressive loads. Like, for instance, um, one of the coal gantries that span across the highways that hold um, uh, the equipment for, you know, like the, list or toll, toll list billing or what, what have you, that was done here in Florida. And the challenge with that is, you know, how do you film something that's so large uh, that's moving at, you know, 50, 55 miles an hour, but also keep it interesting. So, you know, building in the process of capturing audio or capturing a dialogue, things like that, ends up making it more, more interesting than just, you know, photos or just, you know, some, some clips of some things. So it, I, I never know, basically, I never know what I'm going to go into or how it's going to turn out until I get there and then when everything's all done. So it falls into the editing process of how to make it even more creative than, than what it was. Do you have a team of people or is it just you? It's just me. Wow. That is impressive. Um, what would you say would be the coolest thing you've ever shot? Uh, the coolest thing um, that I ever shot, you know, personally that I that I enjoy, that I look back on, and I go like, "Wow, that was awesome." It was a, a segment that I needed to have, or actually, it was an, uh, a piece of audio that I needed to have. 
for a video that I'd already filmed and I realized that, wait, well, I'd like to have the driver restate this just because, you know, he kind of left out some parts and most of like, I would say 98% of what is filmed is all done in real time. There's never any redos. There's no take two or three. It's just shot the first time and that's it. So the ability to get it right and, and come across the right way is that that's really important for me. So there's no Hollywood double takes or whatever. But in this case, since I knew that the driver comes through, you know, and this is in Florida and he comes through my area, you know, once every you know week or two weeks. So it's not a problem for me to hop back out on the highway and just say, Hey, Keith, I want to, you know, I, I want to, you know, have you restate this because we left out some facts. So I, I gave him a heads up that that's what I wanted to do. And he's like, yeah, we're going to come through around, you know, one thirty two in the morning, you know, going down the, the turnpike, you know, headed to South Florida. So I'm like, all right, cool. You know, perfect time of the night, you know, not a whole lot of cars on the highway. And so I got what I needed to get, which is all of like, maybe like a minute worth of audio, but we still had another 20 miles to go. And so uh, he was traveling with two other guys. It was Tony Staub, Josh Lemke, and uh, Keith Smart Jr. So I said, hey, guys, well, uh, we got some time to kill. Let's do something cool. You know, the, the road's going to open up to four lanes. So it went from two lanes to, to four lanes, you know, traveling in the same direction. Let's, uh, once it opens up four lanes, I want to get you guys, you know, not just side by side, but I want to do something kind of cinematic where it starts where it looks like there's just one of you, you know, in the, the left lane, the, the lane closest to the left. And then another truck appears and another third truck appears, kind of like sprouting up like a flower. That's mm-hmm. the easiest way to, to, to explain it. And this is why I have so much uh, appreciation for these guys and because they're experienced, they know what they're doing. And this is, would apply to almost every truck driver uh, that has some experience on the belt. They, they know what they're doing. And I, I trust my life with them enough to ride directly next to them to film these things. But I only had to explain it that one time and then we executed it. And it was one of the coolest pieces of the video that I've, I've ever filmed because, you know, the lighting was awesome. You know, we're traveling at 70 miles an hour. An hour. It looks really cool. And, you know, the, the stuff that you might see in Hollywood, actually, you've not seen anything like this in Hollywood movies. But I'm like, this is like really cool. I mean, we're on the level of a Hollywood movie. We're not trying to make a Hollywood movie, but. You know, this is the stuff that they would have stump drivers do, you know, and they have to practice it and rehearse it. And it's awesome that we can just get out here and just do it, do it one time. It looks awesome and and put it out for, you know, everyone else in our industry to enjoy and and go on with our day. So that was like one of the coolest scenes that I've ever filmed. And there's a, there's a lot, lot of others as well. But that was a fun one. If someone does just want to find you online, uh, how can they do that? search the term big rig videos or uh, if they want to find me in particular they can just search my name that was chris fifey talking about his career and company big rig videos to check out his website you can visit bigrigvideos.com for landline now i'm ashley blackford Thanks, Ashley. Remember that the Truckers for Troops campaign continues all the way through the start of Business Monday. Call 816-229-5791 or go to ooida.com to take part. Again, that's 816-229-5791. That's our program for today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. 
We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.